Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thank you to our generous underwriters here on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information and Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Monday, August 29th, we are studying Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 to 23. God's generosity toward Israel and his act of freeing them from slavery in Egypt provide the motivation for the generosity that Israel is to have toward the poor among them. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word to date, we have with us regular guest, Pastor David Boisclair. Pastor Boisclair serves at Bethesda and Faith Lutheran Churches in North St. Louis County, Missouri. Pastor Boisclair, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Oh, it's always uh, joyful to continue to sharpen oneself uh, with the Word of God. As we get started today, Pastor Boisclair, let's go through a little bit of context. What should we know leading up to Deuteronomy chapter 15 today? Well, uh, in um, uh, chapter uh, 14, uh, there was, uh, you know, provisions. It, it's kind of like he, uh, Moses is starting to get to, to the nuts and bolts of, of the law for God's people. Uh, in, 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 it, at first, he has a, he, at the beginning of Deuteronomy, points out how, how the journey that they've had, uh, their relationship to God, and and how He released them from slavery, and 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 now He goes into what we would consider to be uh, the laws, uh, like ceremonial laws, uh, so that uh, for the worship of God's people, and also civil laws for when they live in uh, the Promised Land, and um, and and of course, uh, what's what's really uh, very uh, much a blessing about this book is that you get the explanation of why uh, certain laws are are made for the people. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, "Well, why did why did uh, is there this particular law?" You know, here here's sort of like a a rationale or a, or a a, um, uh, a holy purpose for for God in giving these laws. And 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 of course, right before that, you have the what was rather interesting. I just kind of forgotten about it. The poor tithe, mm -hmm. uh, in other words, the tithe for the poor, and and just just some of the uh, you know and some of the practical argumentation and, and explanation is really uh, very interesting here. I appreciate the way that you call this the nuts and bolts of God's law, and I, I think that's a good explanation for what we're starting to see. So far in Deuteronomy, Moses has laid a lot of that groundwork, and he's he's laid out a lot of that why of God's law, as you said. It's good to keep that in mind when you get to these nuts and bolts. And the nice thing about chapter 15 is that more than once, Moses will remind us of the why, as you said, when it comes to the generosity toward the poor, when it comes to the matter of your brother who's sell, sold himself as a slave to you, the why you act in this way is so important so that it's not just an arbitrary thing, but God actually is working for his people's good in these laws. He's showing them what it means for them to be his holy people. It's not just some sort of, well, that's the way it is. Although if he wanted to do that, he could, but he's actually doing what is good for his people. And that is a really helpful thing for us to keep in mind still when it comes to God's law. Exactly. And, and something else uh, to the listeners, too. Uh, you hear a lot in our uh, woke culture about, uh, you know, criticisms about uh, certain uh, aspects in, in, in the scriptures about uh, the provisions for uh, slavery or that there is slavery, it exists, or something else, and then there's such blame uh, placed upon God's word and, and upon uh, our faith and the Jewish faith, for instance, about these things. But these uh, 
some people that are so quick to to uh, snap judgment uh, uh, our our faith uh, don't realize the fact that they have to think about the context uh, this is this is antiquity this is thousands of years ago uh, the provisions that are made by uh, the Lord uh, in, in with his people are so much milder than than the provisions that were true for the other cultures like the Egyptian culture or the Mesopotamian cultures uh, in, 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 in you know they, they were very harsh and and the other thing would be is that in these laws of the Lord there is no uh, uh, you know like a uh, separation of class or caste mm-hmm. or distinction that you are all brothers and sisters and in me, you know, I am your God, and and uh, y- you know, there there's not like, well, you okay, you're you're part of this particular family, so you have these privileges. There's none of that in here. Hmm. Let's go ahead and take a look at this text. Then I'm gonna just go ahead and read the whole chapter for us here at all together, and then we'll we'll talk about it. There's a, I think at least three distinct sections within this, but but we're gonna read the whole chapter to get started. So Deuteronomy chapter 15, Moses is speaking here. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor, his brother, because the Lord's release has been proclaimed. Of a foreigner you may exact it, but whatever of yours is with your brother, you, your hand shall release. But there will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess. If only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all this commandment that I command you today. For the Lord your God will bless you, as he has promised you, and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow, and you shall rule over many nations, but they shall not rule over you. If among you one of your brothers should become poor, in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Take care, lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, and you say, The seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry to the Lord against you, and you be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give it to him, because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you, he shall serve you six years, and in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you let him go free from you, you shall not let him go empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, and out of your wine press. As the Lord your God has blessed you, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this today. But if he says to you, I will not go out from you, because he loves you and your household, since he is well off with you, then you shall take an awl and put it through his ear into the door, and he shall be your slave forever. And to your female slave you shall do the same. It shall not seem hard to you when you let him go free from you, for at half the cost of a hired servant he has served you six years. So the Lord your God will bless you in all that you do." All the firstborn males that are born of your herd and flock you shall dedicate to the Lord your God. You shall do no work with the firstborn of your herd, nor shear the firstborn of your flock. You shall eat it, you and your household, before the Lord your God year by year at the place that the Lord will choose. But if it has any blemish, if it is lame or blind or has any serious blemish whatever, you shall not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. You shall eat it within your towns. The unclean and the clean alike may eat it, as though it were a gazelle or a deer. Only you shall not eat its blood. You shall pour it out on the ground like water. That is our text for today, Deuteronomy 15, verses 1 to 23. So, Pastor Boyce Claire, let, let's get started with this year of release. That's the way the, the ESV translates in that first verse. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. What's what's going on here? What's Moses talking about for the people in this year of release? 
Well, what's rather interesting is that uh, the life uh, kind of the weekly life of the people was based upon the Sabbath. There, there is a one day of rest. And uh, it's sort of like an extension of that in, into the seventh year. Now, we know that uh, on the seven, in the seventh year, uh, the sabbatical year, you might call it, uh, they, uh, f- there is even Sabbaths for uh, your farmland. Uh, that uh, in the seventh year, you were to leave uh, the land, land lie fallow, uh, and, and I'm wondering whether they divided their fields so they'd have at least some fields to cultivate and some that did that they didn't cultivate. But the same thing goes uh, also for um, the uh, like debts in this particular case, um, and and uh, they, they're encouraged to lend to one another and and other pass provisions of course say that they're not to lend at interest now they're, they're in this particular case that at, at the seventh year it, it there is it is to be a year of release now then there's a then there's kind of a quandary uh, a you know dispute as to what exactly that means does that mean the debt is forgiven or does it mean that uh, for that year uh, the uh, creditor will not, uh, you know, demand payment, or or whether he will extend the terms of the loan, and 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 so there's two different uh, two two different uh, arguments there. Now it's interesting, Kyle Dalich, which is of course uh, the um, commentator that I, that I used when I went into the ministry 40 years ago, uh, says that you know he's more for the idea that the debt remains, but the in in the year of release the debtor does not uh you know com- it compel the creditor to to or I mean, it's the other way around the creditor doesn't uh command that the the person owing the money that the debtor pay anything for that year and then he kind of compares that with the uh sab- sabbatical year for the land in other words when let's say the land reaches the seventh year and you allow it to lie fallow it, it isn't the understanding that the you will never plow that land again so in in in, in uh, kyle dalich uh Th- those two commentators' minds, they think that uh, you can't say that the debt is just completely discharged. Hmm. Now, it, what's rather interesting is they mention Philo and the Talmudists, in other words, the Talmud. And so it's understanding among the uh, Jewish uh uh, Judaica and the Jewish writers. They say, no, it means that the debt is completely released. And it, and it, and it, and it, and it seems like that's the more... Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't see the uh, that that you make that analogy or comparison with the land having a Sabbath and the debt being released. You know that that that's not a complete uh, comparison there. That it walks on all fours. <laughs> so, uh, so the idea here is perhaps that uh, th- that they will be released, forgiven the debt. Hmm. I, I'm I'm with you, Pastor Boyce Claire, because I, and I I had read that too. In, in commentaries that perhaps the debt being released was a, just a year off from payment that you didn't demand it, you extended the terms in comparison with the, what happens with the land. And while I guess I can see that, on the other hand, I think the closer comparison that we should use, particularly in Deuteronomy 15, is the comparison that's given in terms of freeing the slave. Because with the, the slave, when he's freed in that seventh year, he doesn't go back into service the following year. He's he's forgiven. His his debt is is over and done. It's released. To me, that seems the closer comparison to this first part of Deuteronomy 15. And and I guess in my mind, that's the way I have always thought about it: is that the debt is released, forgiven in its entirety in that seventh year. Yes, I I think that that's that's a very good insight, and 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 because it's in the context, and and it, and it's relating to, in other words, it's not dealing with uh, fields that are lying fallow, but it's dealing with people. <laughs> That, right. that have debts because because they're they're slaves or they sell themselves into slavery because of their debt. That's right. That's right. So it, I mean, again, that, that seems to be the way to take this in, in my mind too. That this seventh year, the debts are going to be forgiven. There is this uh, differentiation between the foreigner and between the people of Israel in verse three. Is, is there anything that you have on that, Pastor Boyce Claire? 
Um, well, again, um, it, it's there's kind of a closer relationship among Israelites, uh, the people of Israel. They're they're part of the covenant with with Yahweh, with the Lord, and uh, and so it, it's kind of like a, a different. There, there is a distinction between the two, but but there is a lot of uh, you know provisions for uh, you know foreigners being treated kindly. They're allowed right. to live in the land. They're allowed to trade. Uh, they're allowed to even be servants uh, to God's people. Uh, well, in this case, of course, it's it's a, a foreign debtor, um, and 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 but again, uh, you know, there's other provisions that would prevent such a foreigner from being uh, pressed too hard. You know, remember, you were a slave in Egypt for what four hundred years, right. and so, which is interesting, as as the Lord uh, gives um, the uh, th- a third commandment, uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The reason that's mentioned, you know, in 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 the second uh, giving of the law, or, or I mean, a recitation of the law, is that they had been uh, slaves in Egypt for all of that time. Like in 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 Exodus twenty, when it's mentioned, it's it's the creation that that's mentioned as kind of a rationale for uh, the Sabbath. Mm, that's right. That's right. So as as this text continues, then this matter of taking care of the poor really starts to to take over in verse four and really runs through the the rest of this section about releasing debts through verse eleven. What do we what do we start to see Moses talking about the poor among you in verse four and and some of the the things that God promises to His people as they take care of the poor. Well, what's interesting is it seems as if that's a contradiction of uh, verse 11, no. for there will never be cease to be poor in the land. And then you got four, which says, uh, but there will be no poor among you. So, but see that as, as the commentators point out that that's, that's adjustive, that there may be no poor in your land. In other words, uh, you are to conduct yourself so that, uh, uh, you know, you sh- you are to alleviate uh, the suffering of the poor or the existence of, of poor people. And God, of course, uh, cares for us directly and indirectly. You know, he gives us, uh, uh, you know, rains. Uh, we get a lot, we've got a lot of rain <laughs> in the last couple months. Um, and, and, and directly, uh, God uh, bless as you, but also indirectly by the fact that you have those that maybe are a little more blessed than others that are able to uh, kind of share the blessings with those who do not have them. Hmm. So in, in verses 5 and 6 and 7, what what promises does God make his people as they seek to take care of the poor in their land? How does God promise to bless them in that? Yes, uh, and and um, in in, the, in that case, uh, God, uh, you know, gives the favorable weather that, that uh, uh, you know, a lot of um, sometimes uh, in. Uh, the Pentateuch in, in, in Moses' five books, uh, he mentions about how uh, the wild animals will not attack you. And, you know, I mean, like if you look at the end of Deuteronomy, we got the blessings and curses. Uh, you know, if you are faithful to the Lord, uh, the Lord will, will uh, open up the, uh, the, um, uh, the storehouse of the heavens and, and allow rain and, and other things. But if you are, if you are not uh, faithful to the Lord, uh, then uh, the sky will be like brass and iron above you and 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 things are going to go badly for you it, it but it's interesting it, it's in line with this you can tell from reading uh, Deuteronomy that <clears throat> the truth of what our Lord Jesus said uh, in quoting scripture quoting the Word of God uh, I desire mercy yeah. and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings and and so uh, you know again it, it 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 just emphasizes how God's love for his people and he loves them even though they're a sm- uh, you know they're not worthy of that love they're not the greatest or most uh, prestigious of all of the peoples on earth but but they are god loves them uh uh, mercifully and uh, unconditionally uh, certainly the mercy and grace of god in choosing his people israel and in caring for them has been a, a constant theme in deuteronomy and once again pro- provides the backbone for what Moses is talking about here. In verses 6 and 7, Moses says that the Lord will bless his people, as he promised, such that they will lend to nations and not have to borrow. They'll rule over nations and not be ruled. What is what is Moses telling them there? 
Well, it's rather kind of interesting. St. Paul uh, put it this way, uh, oh, no, any... Owe no one anything but to love one another. I believe that's uh, what Romans 12 or Romans 13. Um, in in this particular case, uh, you have the danger of nations which are are pagan and don't believe in the Lord uh, might might have the possibility of of um, you know basic lording it over you, uh, taking you into captivity or 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 subjugating you as 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 the case may be. I think that's kind of like an interesting thing in our own day and age when the possibility of our uh, of of the United States, uh, you know, being in debt to other nations. You know, it, it's not that this is a law for them because this is a this is a uh, civil law for God's people. It isn't it isn't uh, it isn't to be imposed uh, on on uh, the the uh, you know, le- uh, political structure of our day and age, but it's kind of like a rule. It's kind of an interesting rule. It, it's sort of like good advice that God gives them. You know, don't do this. Don't uh, become debtors to those who are not uh, fellow believers. Mm. In, in verse seven, then Moses returns to a more individual way of speaking. He's he's been kind of corporate there in verses six and or excuse me, five and six. Now in verse seven, in the more in an individual sense, he says, Look, if you see one of your brothers become poor, don't harden your heart and and particularly don't fail to give to him when you see that seventh year coming. Don't let that affect your generosity, which I, this is such a, a wonderful thing that Moses does here, kind of looking and, and knowing human nature, uh, the, the tendency to harden our hearts when we know we're going to have to forgive a debt. He warns against that, which I, I love that. What does Moses have to say here is, as he again can, encourages this generosity among God's people? Yeah, he, he doesn't want the person to be a, a miser, uh, a, a a a person that hoards wealth or or whatever or is 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 um, you know has has sort of a coldness toward those who are in need, uh, and and in a sense it kind of talks about our uh, our thought life in God that that should be uh, sanctified uh, by the power of God's spirit, that we don't have uh, evil motives in what we do in, in this particular. So it, it, it kind of explains, uh, you know, how you are to, uh, you know, regard this, you know, God is, God, it would please God if you, you don't have that type of uh, stinginess, uh, that's not the way God acts, you know. As 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 our Lord says, you know, He causes His rain uh, to fall upon the righteous and the unrighteous. So, you know, you should also be good to those who uh, who are your considered maybe your enemies, you know. Uh, uh, you know, if you do good to the people that love you, uh, what, what, ro- what reward do you have? But if you do good to those who are uh, your enemies, uh, you're acting like your heavenly father. Right. I think he, he also says if you lend to those who can pay you back, that's the, the same thing that the Gentiles do. And, and here we are talking about that very context, lending to those who can't pay you back. And, and particularly, you know, imagine you're in this, this seven-year cycle and you're in year six, and you know the seventh year is coming when all these debts are going to be forgiven. This is the temptation that Moses is talking about. You see your brother in need, and and maybe you know he needs $10,000, and, and the temptation for you is to say, well, I'm going to loan him 1000 right now so that I can loan him the other nine when we get to, to year eight, and, and we can collect the debt again. I, that's the temptation that he's warning against. And again, it's just a brilliant move on Moses's part because he, he knows that that's that's our, our nature to to have that, as you said, a miserly heart rather than than letting God be the one to shape our heart after his his generous heart. And you can kind of think of the parable. The parable. I know it's about uh, forgiveness. What the parable about the uh, the uh, servant who owed a king uh, millions of dollars. A king forgave that debt, and then, but then he didn't have. Uh, he wasn't willing to uh, remit uh, a a hundred denarii debt of of his fellow servant. 
and uh, and, and you know that that's kind of, that kind of a, kind of a things that freely you have received freely give the Lord says yeah no I I think that parable is a fantastic one to bring up the, uh, another one that actually came to my mind with this was the parable of the sometimes it's called the workers in the vineyard where the master goes out and hires people to work all day long and even those who were hired at the eleventh hour receive the full day's payment I, I mean I. In my mind, that's a picture of our Lord showing the kind of generosity that he commands here. He doesn't begrudge those in that 11th hour the full benefit of being a part of his kingdom. He gives freely. And of course, in, in, in that parable, then, you know, the, the first ones grumble because they have this evil eye. Their eye looks grudgingly. It's it's funny how the—well, I don't know. It's not, it's not funny, I suppose. It's quite— quite appropriate that you have that same sort of language in Deuteronomy and in the Gospel of Matthew that it's the you know this evil eye that we have this begrudging eye that looks on God's generosity as if he's done something wrong and he says no I haven't done anything wrong at all in fact I, I want you to share this generosity and that's where the parable you brought up goes in so well he showed that generosity to us first yeah and and I think another thing is the fact that in in the parable of the laborers in the vineyard uh, he he has the 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 ones that were hired at the 11th hour get their pay first <laughs> In other words, it's kind of like he's he's uh, uh, kind of rubbing their noses in it. I mean, I don't mean to say that in in a in a bad sort of way. It's just say, well, look at look at uh, this is this is how I deal. This is I, don't I have the right to do what I want with what belongs to me? And God owns everything. And uh, you know, uh, we 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 are thankful and 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 for His love and mercy that we we get some of it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or that's you right. or use some of it. <laughs> yes, that's right. And as he has been generous with us, that generosity then compels us, motivates us to show the same generosity to our neighbors. We're going to take our break on Sharper Iron. You're listening to Pastor David Boisclair this morning. Help us through Deuteronomy chapter 15. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Monday, August 29th. We're studying Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 to 23 with Pastor David Boisclair. He serves at Bethesda and Faith Lutheran Churches in North St. Louis County, Missouri. Pastor Boisclair, prior to the break, we've been talking about this matter of taking care of the poor, that the Lord's generosity in giving to his people provides the motivation for his people being generous with the poor among them. Over and over again in Deuteronomy, the Lord has emphasized the great bounty that he will give to his people in the promised land. And so here is that command to take that bounty that the Lord has given to them and share it freely with the poor. Moses wraps this section up in verse 11. He says, there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. How does how does Moses wrap this section up there in verse 11 about taking care of the poor? Yes, it, what's what's rather interesting is is there is a there's a stern warning here in verse 10 where it says uh, the Lord your God will bless you. Okay, or, or you know or it says that um, 
or I'm sorry, it's in verse nine, where it says, uh, it, "Beware, lest if some if you're cheating somebody or you're harsh with somebody, that such a person that is undergoing this, uh, you know, very deep hardship, the cries to the Lord uh, against you, and you be guilty of sin, or as." As uh, uh, James puts it, you know, maybe if you you don't you're not uh, you don't pay your workers, uh, you know, if you're a wealthy person and you don't pay your workers, uh, they they you know that the their cries will go to the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, and and uh, you know and, and Luther Luther of course says this woe unto you if you allow that to happen because uh, you know there there is there is judgment on on the part of God here, but. Uh, uh, the, the thing is, is that uh, uh, it, it's. I, I think it's so beautifully stated in verse eleven, where it says, "You shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land." You know, and, and Jesus. I, I just love how in the in the gospel, I think it wasn't. Uh, it might have been this past one where he says, you know, lend and give to the poor and, and provide for yourselves. Uh, you know treasure or you know wallets in heaven and and uh, you know because where your treasure is there your heart will be also you know use wisely what god has entrusted you as a steward to use in this life and and uh you know do do his work of caring for those who are in need mm, yeah the the imagery that moses uses there in verse 11 about open wide your hand really is a strike a striking image and and it is with a, an open hand that we have received from the lord and rather than succumbing to the temptation of closing our hand around it to hold on tightly to what the lord has given as if my security rests in holding on to that. Rather, the command is to leave the hand open wide so that those who are in need can receive the Lord's bounty from that, knowing that it came from him in the first place. It really is a beautiful way of, of thinking about caring for the poor when, when we recognize that we have freely received from the Lord first. Who are we to then refuse to freely give to those around us who are in who are in need? It, it's really a beautiful thing when it works. Of course, our sinful nature often gets in the way, and there is always much need for repentance. But the the words of Moses here are, are wonderfully helpful to us as Christians. Still, as as you said, our Lord Jesus Christ draws from them as He teaches us in the Gospels as well. Any more thoughts on on caring for the poor before we move on to the next section? Well, obviously, uh, you know, with how we deal with what we're entrusted with in this life has to do also with our worship of God, because those who are covetous, those who want to, uh, you know, just kind of just uh, treasure up something just for themselves or keep it all for themselves are actually committing idolatry. Co- covetousness is idolatry. And, and so, and so it is not, uh, you know, when, and, and you know, it's quite, sort of like this, uh, as Luther says, you have the, the God mammon, you know, in among, uh, you know, Hebrew thought, uh, the God mammon is an idol that, that is put against God and that the people serve, you know, for, if you are poor, uh, you think that you don't have any money, that you have nothing, that you're, that, that, that you're destitute, that you're hopeless, you know, you don't have a proper faith in God. And if you are rich and you have, uh, everything that, uh, you possibly could need uh, day in day out uh you 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 don't even think about god you don't even think about praying to him or asking him for help right once again the the other commandments always come back to the first and so as we think about our need to avoid covetousness we're also reminded of our need to trust in god above all things in verse 12 of this text moses turns to a slave who is either a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, one who who sells himself or herself into slavery. And we have this idea of release again, setting free, and how you treat that person when you set them free. Maybe before we, we talk about those mechanics, let's just make sure we understand what we're talking about. A Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman is sold or sells himself to you. What's, what's in mind here? Well, obviously, uh, the it's because of sin that there is want, or, or 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 poverty in the world, um, and uh, you know the, that the way that the world is uh, in this particular case, uh, uh, you know it it it's sort of a, a repeat of of what um, is is said earlier in in the Pentateuch um, in um, 
Exodus uh, chapter 21. Uh, it says, I, I don't know if we do you want to share, it's like uh, verses 2 through 6. Um, if, you've got it, it, if you've got it in front of you, go ahead and read it for us. Yeah, yeah. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh, seventh he shall go out free. This is, of course, is Exodus 21, verses 2 through 6. For, for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will go I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that kind of maybe gives you a little bit of context for this to some extent. And what's interesting is, is that a female, uh, a Israelite female is not mentioned, but it is mentioned in our text. So that 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 is uh, that that's something that's brought in there. But but unfortunately, uh, there's debt in the world, um, and it, it may not be because someone is is uh, frivolous with their money or, or wasteful. Uh, but but they may be uh, fall on hard times because of illness or because uh, they're if they're if they farm, their land is not productive. Um, you know, for many reasons uh, that. But it is of course your brother Israelite or your sister. Israelite that's involved here. Mm. Well, and I think again in the context as we were talking about earlier, we were just talking about the releasing of debt. Here we have a very specific way that a debt might be paid, which is through labor for another person. But just like that debt in the first part of the chapter would be released in the seventh year, so then would this person being a, a slave in the seventh year, that debt would be released in totality. And and what's striking is not only do you let the slave go free, but you actually give to him on top of it. What are some of the provisions that Moses makes for this releasing of slaves that happens in the seventh year? Yes. Um, you know, and, and it's kind of like what happened when the uh, the Israelites were released from Egypt. Yeah. Uh, they they it said they sp- despoiled or they spoiled the Egyptians. In other words, that they gave them, uh, you know, gifts as as they were leaving the land. And, and it, it's kind of like a, as sort of as a compensation to some extent for the 400 years of slavery that they that they, uh, you know, forced service that they were subjected to. Uh, in this particular case, it's it's like, uh, you know, and then and, and it was rather interesting. There's a little rationale there. If if you had to uh, pay a hired worker, you would have paid twice as much as you would have paid for uh, this particular per individual that has sold themselves into slavery to you. Mm. Right. So the, the idea is, is to recognize once again how the Lord has blessed you and then care for the one who is in need according to those blessings that the Lord has given you, such that it's it's not simply a payment for time served, but it is there's almost a, an offering characteristic to it that this is a gift given freely because of what the Lord has done. So I respond out of you know, out of thanksgiving to his grace and mercy for giving, I respond by taking care of this one who has helped me in all these ways. It's not only a payment, but goes, I think, above and beyond that. I consider how the Lord has blessed me. And now as this person goes forth from my service, I bless him in return, according to how God has blessed me. It's it's centered in what God has done yet again. Exactly. And then, and obviously, as, as we have said, uh, after on the seventh year, they're, they're free, they're discharged, the, the, the debt is paid or is paid in full. Uh, they're, they're not going to the, the next year, they're not going to be there anymore, uh, if they want to go free on this in the seventh year. And, and so it's kind of like a, a situation, it's sort of helping the person start out anew uh, in the eighth eighth year, you might say. Yeah, that's right. I think that's exactly what's going on, that you know, you care for this person who has paid his debt to you, and now that debt is completely forgiven in the seventh year. So now you help him out as he goes forth, and you do so, verse 15, you know, because the Lord 
has freed you from slavery in Egypt. As you said from the outset of our conversation, Pastor Boyce Claire, the why of these laws is so important. And, and particularly verse 15, here's the really big why when it comes to taking care of that, that Israelite. It's because the Lord set you free from slavery. Now you're going to do the same in the seventh year. It, that backbone again of the law is so, so important. Yes, and and uh, you you can kind of see an interplay of the different laws in in Deuteronomy. In other words, yes, we we distinguish between the moral law, the ceremonial law, and the civil or political law, but but all of them kind of uh, you know work together. Uh, that there there is a there is a moral aspect to all of this. Uh, in other words, to to be kind. You know, the fifth commandment: Thou shalt not murder. Uh, you know. In, this, in other words, you're to care for your neighbor and all of his bodily needs. So, so that that's kind of like in mind, where where you have a specific. Uh, this would be a civil or a political law that is given. Now, in in verse sixteen, Moses adds a provision that perhaps the the slave says, "I don't want to leave," and and some reasons why, and then what to do in that case. So take us into this this process that's given there in verse sixteen and following. Yeah, and, and in in um, uh, the passage that I read uh, from Exodus, where where it, it you know it, let's say that uh, you know the uh, the Israelite uh, master uh, provides a wife to to this individual, and then and then it, it, it according to the that particular law that the, that the wife would have to stay behind uh you know that's that's quite a quite a factor in in wanting to stay with it but uh you know maybe maybe this this particular individual you know he he loves the family he he was treated well uh, uh he, or he or she and and then uh they there it, it mentions in the uh, Exodus passage that they're brought to the Lord. In other words, it's kind of in the in the in the sight of God. Uh, you take there's sort of like a a ritual that's going through. It's rather painful, I'm sure. Uh, taking taking the uh, person that wants to be bound uh, into the the household for the rest of his or her life, you take him to the door of the home, and then you take an awl as a sharp point and and you and you pierce their ear. That's probably why some of the some of the folks in ancient and antiquity wore uh, earrings because that that was sort of like a, a seeing that they they are that that type of slave. Hmm. Is, is there any is there any reason that it's an all piercing the ear as the, as the place that is marked? Did you find anything about is there a symbolism there or some some sort of particular significance to piercing of the ear or is that just the maybe a convenient thing to do? Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't found anything, but uh, I, I imagine that if if uh, if if I were to kind of uh, dig. I, I'd probably find something, but I didn't in, in the um, sources that I consulted, I didn't find anything. Yeah. There, I, but I, have, I, have you found anything? No, no, I didn't see much, much either. So I didn't know if there was something about, you know, the ear into the door frame, if those were, were significant things, or if it was, that was just a, a simple way to, to indicate visually to this person that you now have promised yourself to this family, I, something like that. I, but I didn't know if there was something particular to the ear. I didn't find anything either. I was just curious if you had. But the 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 point I think is it's worth noting that you know there's a reason to it, as you pointed out. You know, it's because he loves you because he's being well treated. He's loved in this household. That's why you you might do this. And again, as you pointed out, the one who has received the service does well to remember that the Lord has blessed the person through this service. Any final thoughts through verse 18 on this matter of the, the hired slave being released in the seventh year? Well, the fact is, is that there is an end to the um, servitude that is there. Um, that the seventh year, in, in you know, the seventh year or also the year of Jubilee, too. There's there's also that type of uh, free freeing of those that are bound in this way. Uh, at, at that particular time as well. You know, the, the, in other words, if you take uh, a seven, there's s seven uh, sabbatical years that comes to 49, and then you have the 50th year, which is the, the year of Jubilee, mm. where, where this happens. Uh, you know, and, and, and it just reminds us how 
uh, our Lord Jesus Christ uh, has has freed us from slavery to sin. Um, and, and of course, it is he that has taken on himself the, the task of, of, of paying the debt. Mm, that's right. Yeah, I'm reminded of Jesus' first sermon in Nazareth, recorded there in Luke chapter 4, where he, he quotes from the prophet Isaiah, and, and part of his sermon is to is talking about how he's setting prisoners free. I think that's, and I imagine that, the captives. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. That's the language from Isaiah. And and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, a reference to that year of Jubilee, as you said. So in the book of Deuteronomy, here in chapter 15, we see Moses yet again pointing us forward to what our Lord Jesus Christ will do in setting us free from slavery to sin. In verse 19 through the end of the chapter, Moses picks up one more topic. He talks about firstborn males born to your herd and what to do with them in terms of worship. And sometimes when you don't use them for worship, what do we see in in this last section in verses 19 and following? Well, it's a reminder uh, of the 10th plague in Egypt where uh, uh, the... uh, uh, the Lord uh, sent uh, the death, uh, not the death angel. It's something that that we uh, uh, some some folks, uh, some uh, persons who have uh, taught the Bible thought that there was an angel of death or something that was sent through. It's it it, it, it in a sense it's the Lord going through the land, uh, the firstborn of the Egyptians of of from the highest to the lowest, and their animals uh, died uh, in this judgment. Of God, and and in this place, it's sort of to remind them of their uh, again their being released from slavery in Egypt in this way, and and uh, not only the f- firstborn of the flock or the firstborn from the field uh, was set aside belonging to the Lord. Um, is that the case? But as I said, the, that even your firstborn children too uh, are, and then and then of course you redeem them. Uh, you know, there's there's a provision for, uh, you, you know, if you have a, a good uh, donkey that uh, is a firstborn um, in your in your uh, uh, your farm, uh, that you can redeem that donkey uh, with money, or or of course you would um, you know break its neck as as is said. And in this particular case, it shows how. Uh, you know, this is kind of like a a fellowship offering. Uh, when when perhaps these firstborn uh, animals are are unclean or or have blemishes, you're not supposed to offer them in sacrifice. And then there's the provision of of uh, you know dealing with uh, the doing this when you uh, live at, at great distances from Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Which in uh, you know of course they didn't know it was going to be Jerusalem, but at the time uh, when this kind of comes into play, uh, you know when when the kingdom of Israel is set up, uh, Jerusalem is the place that God has placed His name, and that would be where you had to bring uh, all of these firstborn uh, animals or or the produce and so on. And and like you saw in in chapter fourteen, where they uh, every three years you would gather, maybe uh, you would take. Uh, the first fruits of your uh, of animals or whatever, and, and trade it in for money, and then you would provide uh, help to uh, those who are in need again. Uh, but in this case, it's a reminder of God's deliverance of His people from Egypt. Right. The matter of the firstborn, uh, as you said, very very clearly recalls the matter that happened when the Lord let them free from Egypt, when he set them free and rescued them. And Exodus 13 says more about this matter of firstborn males. You brought up some of that context already. Uh, The matter of the Lord choosing a place for his name, and that's where you're going to go. We've heard about that before. We're going to hear about it again, especially in the coming chapter where the Lord lays out some feasts that the people will celebrate in that place. Here, here we're talking primarily about the, it sounds like the cattle and the sheep with the herd and the flock. And it, it mentions here that if there's a blemish, you're not going to sacrifice that. You're not going to take it to that place. You're going to instead eat it in your towns. Why, why is an animal with a blemish not to be taken for sacrifice in Jerusalem, but rather to be eaten in the town? Why, why, what's the problem with an animal with a blemish? Well, as um, 
you know, in the case, of, you know, uh, I think it's either Malachi or Haggai or, or one of the one of the minor prophets deals with people that are uh, that sacrifice uh, blemished animals. You don't you don't uh, sacrifice something which is uh, defective like that to God. It, it reminds us of the fact of the provision that God makes for the sins of the world uh, effectively and 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 primarily with our Lord Jesus Christ uh, being a sacrifice without blemish and without spot, without sin, as the one who is sacrificed for the sins of the whole world. And so, you know, again, you know, this this is kind of like pointing forward to, it, it's sort of like a proclamation of uh, the innocent and uh, pure and blem. Um, you know, the blemishless son of God who is sacrificed for us on the cross. And then on verse 22, or excuse me, 23, Moses closes this section out with a reminder about not eating the blood and pouring it out on the ground instead. Uh, Remind us why the Israelites were not to eat the blood of, of their animals. Well, there, there's the other passage that the, the life is the blood. Um, and, and, uh, and, and again, that is something that is only dedicated to God, uh, and 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 it is un it is considered to be, um, you know, ceremonially uh, wrong for them to to eat the blood. That's that's uh, it, it kind of the point to the fact too that there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood too, as as the writer of the letter to the Hebrews says, uh, but. Um, uh, in the, in this particular case, that's that's uh, b- how God wishes to order the ceremonial worship of the people, and also pointing forward to the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ, His blood is uh, the perfect ransom for the sins of the world. So, Pastor Boyce, Claire, we have about four minutes here on the morning, and as you said at the very beginning, we've got some nuts and bolts to God's law for his people Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 15. Uh, with the rest of the time that we have, what I'd like to do is kind of is zoom out a little bit, and and remembering that all Scripture points us to Jesus Christ, our Savior, crucified and risen for our forgiveness— how do we see that in this chapter, in the nuts and bolts of this section of Deuteronomy? How do we see our Savior Jesus Christ? Well, he is the one that uh, uh, announces, as as you've mentioned, like in his fir- in his sermon at Nazareth, uh, the release of the captives, um, the reason for um, poverty, and the reason for uh, all of the terrible circumstances in the world is sin. And, and there is a need to deal with sin. And uh, God, who is a loving, the loving God, who uh, d- is not willing that any should perish, but that all reach repentance, is always the one that's doing good for human beings. He loves human beings. And he loves sinners. And, and, and the idea here is, is that it, it, it points us forward to what the provision that the Lord has done with with his precious son, who also, you know, reminded the people of his day, you know, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And, 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 and sort of the, kind of puts everything in context that uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, and that's that's kind of the wider perspective. Pastor David Boisclair is pastor at Bethesda and Faith Lutheran Churches in North St. Louis County, Missouri, helping us today with Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 to 23. Pastor Boisclair, thanks for being our guest today. It's been always a blessing. May God bless uh, all God's people that are in the sound of our voices. The debt is forgiven every seventh year in the same rhythm of the week. So the rhythm of the years, there was rest in year seven. Debts are forgiven. Slaves are released. A picture of our Lord Jesus Christ who comes to set us free, to release the debt of our sin, to set us free from slavery to sin. How? Through his sacrifice as the firstborn, the son of God without blemish or defect, Jesus has given his life in our place to forgive our sins, to earn our release. 
I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about Deuteronomy, we would love to hear from you. Send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. You can also use the app. The open mic feature there allows you to send up to a 60-second message to us. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.